So this is Mikhail Sogan. Uh, I am the uh, Vice Chair and Residency Director at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. You are listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, welcome Dr. Michaelis Hogan, Vice Chair of Education and Residency Program Director of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. He oversees all educational and training programs within the department. He's an Associate Professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Bioengineering. He is Co-Chair of the UPMC Orthopedic Bundling Advisory Board, sits on the UPMC Orthopedic Service Line Steering Committee, and serves on the Executive Committee of the Department of Orthopedics. He has over 100 manuscripts, book chapters, and presentations. He presents both nationally and internationally on his management of foot and ankle injuries, regenerative medicine, and clinical outcomes research. 2014, Dr. Hogan received the American Orthopedic Association Emerging Leader on the Move Award. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining Interview with the Surgeon. Today, we welcome Dr. Michaelis Hogan, Residency Program Director of Orthopedic Surgery at UPMC. Doc, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Doing good. Thank you for being with us. Let's get this started. What were your goals and aspirations during your residency, and how did those change throughout your fellowship? Uh, for me, I, I had a strong interest in academia um, for residency. And so during residency, academia for a career after residency, but so during residency, I really wanted to really just thrive in that environment. Uh, and my goal was to really, uh, how can I help improve the environment that I'm in, you know, make it better than how I found it, uh, become a great surgeon and really kind of soak up all the knowledge and opportunities that existed during that time. And so uh, in addition, recognizing that and knowing that I wanted to go into an academic career long term, I really sought out a number of opportunities to, to be as academic as possible, if one would describe that, in addition to learn how to be a great surgeon, uh, really pushing uh, to understand the scientific method, to understand orthopedic research, to understand where the opportunities were to really uh, contribute to the field. Uh, and I, I really enjoyed teaching uh, and uh, the team aspects of what we do in orthopedics, uh, and particularly in medicine and, and academics. So uh, those are my main drives then. Uh, going into fellowship, I really wanted to have an environment that would really expose me to as, as many, um, you know, as much pathology as possible uh, and variable practice settings. Uh, at University of Virginia for residency, I definitely received that. But then in going into my foot and ankle fellowship at uh, Hospital for Special Surgery, the, the goal was, you know, how can I see as the most unique things as well as the most bread and butter uh, and, and particularly the dynamic of how different individuals and different specialists and different experts actually approach the field uh, and really put that web together uh, and you put, put together that web and then try uh, working to apply that when I went into practice. So taking us through that fellowship year, what was your mentality heading into your first job search and how that perspective changed the beginning years of your career? So I, I was, <laughs> my situation is a little bit unique. Um, my, my wife happens to be a physician. I mean, her, all the plaques behind me pretty much belong to her. I'm, I'm just living in her home, but uh, she's a radiologist and so she was several years behind me and she was interested in going, doing a fellowship. And so I really had to start early during my chief year of residency, looking into, okay, for the, with the timing, where are the different academic opportunities that also she would be able to excel and advance her career. Uh, and recognizing that I wanted to do academics and teach, um, that really drove my search. Uh, and so uh, I really reached anyone that I met who may be in an environment or a place that uh, I may be willing to practice. I, I, I kept their card or their name. Um, and I reached out to them. I looked at ads, but I also, uh, early on uh, during my chief year, going into it, I had spoken to several mentors. And for me, I actually drafted a cover letter of what I thought I was looking for in a job, um, knowing that I wanted to go into academics or at the most providemics. And then I also had my CV that I continuously updated. Uh, and I had a pretty much standard, generic, very, uh, I felt professional uh, blurb about myself, two, two or three sentences, very brief, uh, saying that I'm interested uh, in, in identifying a you know, clinically robust opportunity in orthopedic foot and ankle surgery that also had opportunities for research and teaching uh, and uh, it just asked if they would respectfully consider my application or my CV if an opportunity opened. It was pretty much that simple. And then I cold emailed that to about 10 to 15 uh, departments around the country uh, that I had interest in. Uh, and also where I may have seen ads and formally submitted it. And some got back to me, uh, some did not. Some were very respectful saying, we're not recruiting now, thanks for reaching out. Some I didn't hear anything from and I said, okay, no problem. Um, and uh, there were a couple that took the bait and then and from there the, the interview trail was on again. And so that's how I approached it. And now going into that, can you kind of take us through that journey from where you started to where you are now running the program? 
Uh, so for me, I mean, it, an interesting story. I mean, the the individual who recruited me here is is my chairman, uh, Dr. Freddie Fu. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting him when I was a resident at University of Virginia, working in the lab when he was visiting, giving grand rounds. And so, what then led to it after, uh, I essentially uh, met him, and he said, "Oh, you should think about coming to do orthopedics at University of Pittsburgh." And I said, "Oh, I thought it was just being nice." And so, but I stayed in touch with him and shot him an email. And one of the emails I sent him said, hey, I'm applying to, for jobs. Uh, if something, anything is, may happen to be open, again, just like I mentioned. Um, and he said, well, you should come interview, <laughs> like immediately. He was one of the first to reply, uh, striking the iron hot. And so I came to visit. Uh, then I visited several other academic institutions, all positive experiences, and as well as my home program. Uh, and the opportunity here at University of Pittsburgh, uh, in my mind, was the best one. Uh, for the environment, um, the resources here, the opportunity to contribute uh, to a great department and learn from a number of individuals. And uh, I, then I started practice here. Uh, early on in that, Dr. Fu then asked if I would serve as the associate program director uh, due to my background in teaching education and also in a residency program kind of oversight and, and reviews uh, that I did as a resident back at University of Virginia. And then it went from there. And so um, I was the associate director for three years and uh, for three or four years, and now the program director for the last several uh, of my uh, seven and a half year tenure here. Uh, and uh, it's been a great experience, great clinical practice, uh, great department. I have great partners, uh, great residents, and uh, we, we push higher together. On that same thought process, what would you say were some of the keys of your success that shaped your early career as you rise the ranks in the academic world? Um, so I think it's very important to, to really focus on and have attention to detail in your clinical practice um, and uh, really, you know, giving your patients the time they need and deserve, uh, being available. Uh, you know, I, I really, and I still do this, maybe a gift and curse. I mean, I, I, I'm willing to see anything and say, hey, how may I help this individual? And even if I'm not the best person for them to see, I say, hey, you know, I, I will help guide them on their kind of clinical you know, care journey. Um, and you really want to focus on being as clinically excellent as possible. I mean, all of us are going to have complications. All, we will all have challenging patients, uh, but you really want to strive for excellence and, you know, being that surgeon um, and, and that, uh, that physician that people say, you know what, you know, you, you want this individual's opinion. You know, you want to talk to them. You want to give your patients the time they deserve. Uh, and also being available to individuals who want to send patients your way or even just have questions. And so, uh, you're really serving as just a sponge, and uh, and 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 quite frankly, um, uh, being happy about it. Uh, you know, no one actually wants to send patients to someone who's miserable, who you know are always complaining. Um, and and uh, even when you have a hard day, I really take the approach of you know appreciate the hard days. Uh, then the then the good days will feel that much better in the end. So um, that's really I think what has helped me. Um, don't don't create your don't create don't make yourself an island reach out to individuals uh, and ask questions. Uh, and, uh, and then lastly, I think it's very important, I tell my residents this, it's very important, at least from my perspective, uh, figure out how you can contribute positively to your environment. If you're, if you're working to contribute positively to your environment, and I'm an optimist, you can say, hey, this guy doesn't get it. But if you're working to contribute positively to your environment, it's very hard for your environment not to be positive back to you. <laughs> and so, um, and uh, do that listen, uh, learn, and be willing to do anything. And so that's, that was my approach and still is. Now we know that those beginning couple of years when you start your career, it's called two to three years are so important and critical for your career growth. What advice would you have given your younger self now knowing what you know now when you were first starting out? Um, so a lot of it, I mean, the, the structure of orthopedics drives a lot of that. I mean, we, uh, as a discipline, you do your written boards when you finish fellowship or residency. And then you do your oral boards after two years of clinical practice or 20 months of consecutive practice. So it really puts an additional spotlight on that bridge point from training into, into practice. And so um, the advice I give individuals is, you know, be, be very, again, very thorough in your clinical assessments. Um, be, 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 quite frankly, have, have a lot of discipline in how you approach your patients and your clinical review um, and you don't want to cripple yourself with overthinking, but you want to think about everything. <laughs> um, and uh, if you do that, and again, lean on your partners. If you, if you are in an environment where you do not have a lot of clinical partners, lean on your mentors from residency, lean on your friends who are somewhere else. Um, again, 
uh, going against that idea of create, you know, creating an island for yourself. An island's not a great place to be. I've never met an orthopedic surgeon who wants to be on an island by themselves. Um, and so um, I think that's very important. If you do that, again, and, and think about everything that you're doing, um, you can be successful. Uh, and if you have a good network, uh, you definitely want to use that network. And as it relates to selecting a clinical practice, you want to ask them, hey, you know, how do, your, uh, how do those who enter your practice do going into their oral boards? How have they done over the last several years? Uh, have they been successful in, you know, getting through the boards? Has anyone actually gotten through the boards and then left immediately after? Um, it, you don't want to be a pessimist in your question, questions, uh, but as you mentioned earlier, they're asking you all these things about your criteria and how you've come through and what brought you to that point. You know, if you're not going to ask then, when? Uh, so I would be open to that or at least getting that information from somewhere or someone um, as overtly or covertly as needed. Now running the, the program there and overseeing all the residents, what advice do you have for the graduating chief residents and fellows entering the professional job market for the first time? Uh, I think it's very important uh, to start research early. Again, don't be, if you start early, prior preparation prevents, you know, the, you know, the phrase, I mean, it, it prevents things going badly. Um, and recognize that everything is not always going to be perfect, but uh, the more you prepare, uh, you assess and you research, particularly now with so much data being available and the world being so interconnected, um, it will just help guide your decision making. Um, and you want to have an understanding of, you want to have an appreciation for how are the docs who are in that practice? Um, are, are, do they seem, quite frankly, happy with their choice um, or happy with their current environment? And uh, you want to do your due diligence. Uh, I think it's no different than when trying to assess and evaluate an appropriate, uh, you know, uh, an appropriate uh, surgical candidate. You want to really talk to the patient and say, okay, there, is, there's some expectation management. And in no disrespect to my trauma colleagues, but if everything you approach is essentially, okay, it's, 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 it's trauma, last minute. I mean, those are the patients coming in. Most of the best trauma surgeons I know are actually thinking about prior preparation, constant reps. They're actually doing what we're talking about here, um, really trying to assess their environment and control as many factors as they can to lead to the most optimal outcome. And so I think that's what I would advise my chief residents to do. And that's what I advise my residents here to do. Um, you know, do some research, ask some questions, uh, and, and think broadly. Now, with 2020, we've been dealing with the pandemic this year, and a lot of these annual conferences have really gone online. It's all virtual. What advice do you have for the graduating class when it comes to their networking and outreaching process when they can't meet folks like yourself at national conferences? So I, I think it's very important uh, to develop a, it's sad to say, but a virtual presence or an ability, whether it be by video or by phone, uh, to deliver thyself in a positive manner. Um, and kind of understand and know what questions you have for people up front so you're not, um, let's say, tripping over your own words, uh, while at the same time knowing how you want to present who you are uh, in, in the very brief moments that you have. Who you are, where you're from, what you're looking for, uh, I think is very important. And if you can't explain that, how can you expect someone to, to squeeze it out of you? So um, I, I advise individuals in my residence now, you know, think about things prior to the phone call, prior to the video, uh, there's nothing wrong with practicing in the mirror. Uh, before we were all, before technology was everywhere and things were on the whim and people, before we, you know, didn't have to wait for anything, that's what you did, you know, do, do have a mock conversation. Um, sometimes you actually don't know what you'll say to something until someone asks you. So uh, th think about that. Uh, think about your questions that you have. And the other thing I advise people is, okay, think about what your perspective is going to be based on the response you hear. I think that's one of the challenges that individuals have. Um, and I, I'm always, and I try to push myself to do this. There's a difference from listening to respond to something versus listening to understand. And often when you are asking questions or being asked of questions, you have to appreciate that. Uh, and it's better when you're practicing and talking to people prior to kind of drive that conversation. You know, one thing that gets talked about a lot is what do certain programs look for when they're interviewing fellowships for certain spots? What advice do you have for those residents going into that phase in that interview process, similar to what you did a few years back? Um, so when you're getting ready to enter in a fellowship, I mean, people really want to understand, obviously, your surgical skill, because you're talking about when someone's interviewing for a fellowship position, correct? Correct. Yeah. Um, your surgical experience, some individuals, you go into a fellowship because obviously you love that specialty. Uh, but also you want to get a little more, uh, right? You want to have more focus, uh, more honed in 
attention to that particular area. Um, and so when I'm looking at fellowships and advising people on that, you really want to understand the environment. What is the surgical experience? What does it look like? And it's not just purely a numbers game. Oh, they do this many surgeries and this would be a great fellowship. How does they lay out? How does your day-to-day -day experience function? I mean, who are you working with? Are you working with physician extenders, nurse practitioners, PAs, teeing up surgeries? Are you really serving as a first assist or are you just helping facilitate someone else <laughs> doing the surgery? Uh, and there is value in both, but you want to have a balance of that. Uh, there are some of the best techniques and knowledge I've received are from some surgeons who were not as hands-on with their trainees, but that was balanced by other surgeons within the fellowship or within the, my residency who were more hands-on. And so you, you have to really soak up those educational opportunities and across the board, regardless of whom they're coming from. Uh, and the other thing is think outside the box and be available outside the box. I mean, when I was a fellow, I just really tried to be around. Be, again, be accessible, very similar to my approach to practice. Uh, and, and it was more to just try to get as many educational experiences on board as possible. And in fellowship, it's much easier than residency. You, you really don't have the same burdens of uh, some of the duty hour burdens in regards to the different layers of the work you're focusing on, right? In residency, you have all those phases. Even in the ACG and me accredited fellowship where, the, where work duty hours are critical, you're not in a scenario often where you're taking all this call plus your fellowship work. So quite frankly, you, you can figure it out. And uh, the more you're around, the more you can soak up and the more you know, individuals are willing to uh, you know, really uh, pass on their, their knowledge to you. So I would look into that size of fellowship, how they interact with the fellows, how the faculty interact with, them, with one another uh, and, uh, and what their fellows are doing when they leave uh, the fellowship. Those are all the key questions that I put out there. I mean, I think you, you, when, you're, when you're selecting, whether it be fellowship or a job, you really want to do your best to find an environment that's willing to allow you and permit you and propel you to shine in whatever universe you want to shine in. So um, with that, um, uh, you know, look, listen, and learn. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.